Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Please stand and join us as we worship our Heavenly Father.
verse 4. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for blessings Jesus, you don't
I'll try this again. Good morning, Grace Fellowship. How are you all today? And to you out on Facebook, too. Um, as I thought about this message that we had last week, um, it brought me, I'm kind of nostalgic, if you, if you know me very well, and I started thinking about all the Bibles that I've had in my life. And I kind of dug around to see which ones I could find. I got when I was seven. It's King James. I don't think I read it much because I couldn't read very well when I was seven, but it has some interesting pictures in it that I would look at, and it looks like it's got some wear and tear. When I was 14, I made profession of faith, and I got a Bible with my name written on the front or engraved on it. Um, and later on in college, I think there was a Bible called The Way that was more contemporary. I couldn't find that one either. I had a study Bible. Uh, then they came out with the message, and that's when I decided it was okay to write in your Bible. And so I kind of went on the five-year Bible plan and started writing things down and, and underlining things that were meaningful to me. Um, then I started traveling around quite a bit and got a little Bible that I could pack in my suitcase. And then I found out I can't read that anymore because my vision isn't quite the same. So now I have my blue Bible, and it actually, it just, it, you know, the Bible kind of gets, um, you want to say, changed as the times change, but the words stay the same. Um, this is a life hacks Bible. And just reflecting in the songs today um, about generation after generation, um, I'm just really thankful to my family who has, who have been believers. Um, I don't know any family in my background that hasn't been. So, and my grandma, who was born in 1800, you can think about that a little bit, or actually um, 1900, so she lived through the 1900s. This was her favorite verse. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. And that is what we're living today. We need God. Um, now we're going to go forward in time. Um, youth group will be for pre-K through third grade. And they will meet this Wednesday evening from, I believe it's 530 to 7. The tag me group. Um, is on hibernation, and they will re return to their um, meetings in late February. The new members class is being planned. Um, this will be a great opportunity for um, people to learn about what God has done in our church, to connect with others, and to find your place here at Grace. And um, you can email Pastor Chris at pastor at Grace pella.org and give a preference between a uh, Sunday afternoon and a Wednesday evening. Um, next, let's see, this will be January 30, so it's a couple weeks from now. Um, we're going to have our Grace Forum, and that's when you can have questions answered, express concerns, we'll cast um, vision, and see what God has in store for us in this year. And yes, we are busy planning a women's retreat for February 4 and 5, and the theme will be Cultivate Joy. And there are registration sheets, I believe, in your mailboxes. You can pick them up by the mailboxes, um, and you can register online and look at our website for that. And you can also pay online, so it will make it easy. We hope that um, you all come and you bring a friend. Okay, offerings. You can do offerings in many ways. You can give online, you can text, you can mail, you can put an actual check in a basket. So whatever ways you like to give, um, that's all available. And then we have the Four Corners offering with the little treasure boxes around um, the, the, build, or the room here. And the money this month is going to Pastor Ryan Faber, who is currently teaching at a seminary in Zambia. So... Thank you.
does God answer our prayers? I have two offices, the one that's about 200 feet that away, and one at home, and on Fridays and Saturdays, it is my think tank for writing sermons, my inner sanctum, my bat cave, my fortress of solitude, and when the door is shut, it's as if the bridge has been drawn, the moat has been filled. It communicates, it means do not open to my sons. Do not knock. Do not sneak notes underneath. And for goodness sakes, do not open that door. Unless there's an emergency, of course, like an F5 tornado or a house is being circled by bandits. Then and only then is access granted to my holy of holies. But this is not the case with God. For God, access is always granted to him. And it's in Matthew chapter 7 that we find his open door policy. Matthew 7 or page 939 in those brown church Bibles. And Jesus says in verse 7, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who receives, everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your child asked for bread, would give them a stone? Or if they asked for a fish, would give them a snake? If you then... Though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Ask, seek, knock. Prayer is that simple. Jesus is making a point that it's not complicated. It's as if he is saying, come and knock on his door. He's been waiting for you. And one of, one of my favorite spiritual formation experts, Richard Foster, he says, prayer should never be complicated. It was Jesus who taught us to come like children to the Father. And that's what he's doing here. He taught us to come like children, not like grown-ups, because grown-ups like to complicate things. I mean, let's be real. Grown-ups like to complicate everything. Raise your hand if you've had to teach your child or grandchild core, co- common core math. Or, which is supposed to make it simple for some reason, or if you've had to fill out one of the new W-4 forms from the IRS. It is a nightmare. It is complicated because it was made by who? Grown-ups. And Jesus knew as he's saying this, this about God and how God always has an open door policy, he knew that grown-ups would have a tendency to convulate and make prayer a cumbersome task convoluted. It would, it would become something that would feel like a chore, and it would be so burdensome that they would say crazy things like, I am too busy to pray. And you know we've all said that. We've all thought it. I mean, how many of us, in a moment when we are at our wit's end, when things are not going according to plan, and we want to pull our hairs out, when we, we just feel completely overwhelmed, and then we hear somebody say something crazy like, maybe we should pray, and we want to roll our eyes and say, the grown-ups are are working here. We're too busy for that right now. But where does that mindset, that posture even come from? It doesn't come from here. It doesn't come from this good news or the Jesus in Matthew 7. You see, Jesus, he's trying to give us another way, a way that that grown-up in our our minds and us will never fully comprehend or wrap its head around because we're so used to things being complicated. And Jesus, it's as if he's giving us a shortcut to a divine presence. And we struggle with that. I 
Ask, seek, knock. The truth is, is I could break down each of these commands, but the gist of it is, is that going to God, it is so much more simple than we even realize. It doesn't have to be this big chore. Sometimes it's just saying one simple word. It's saying Jesus. On some days, that's all we can blurt out. It's that simple. And there's there's an author, it's unknown who it was, but they wrote this, uh, they wrote this writing called the, the Cloud of Unknowing, and they, they make a point that even the shortest prayers pierce heaven. And they talked about that two-syllable word in the English language, Jesus. And just saying that, and God is listening. But so often we think that prayer is supposed to be a lot of work. That it's supposed to be a tremendous task to undertake, but the truth is, is that Jesus, he doesn't want us to get caught up in, in the busyness of religion, which was how people in the Roman world viewed prayer. Earlier in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, do not make your prayers babbling. Do not be like the pagans who feel like they need to say so many words. In the Roman world, people lived in sort of a manipulative, oppressive religious system where they thought that they had to use so much human effort and work before the gods were even listening. But Jesus, he's showing us a God that is nothing like that, a God that is always available, who always has his door open, a God that doesn't want to create a bunch of hoops for us to jump through. He doesn't need us to grovel on our knees. He doesn't need us to make up an elaborate speech or a doctorate apology to God. He doesn't need us to manufacture some kind of spirituality before we can even gain audience with the high king of heaven. No. Sometimes it's just that shortest prayer, that two-syllable word, Jesus. You know, earlier we... We sang, come Lord Jesus, but the truth is in every moment, God is saying that to us. It's the Jesus that we actually find in in Matthew chapter 11, the one who gives us these good words. And as I read this, I want you to close your eyes for a second. Wherever you have been this week, however you view God right now, however you view prayer, I want this to be like balm to your souls. I want it to lift your spirits from the depths. Close your eyes for a second. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. You can open your eyes. This was actually the passage that we were supposed to read last week. Do you remember last week when I preached a sermon on reading the Bible together and actually forgot to have you open a Bible? I might have quoted from memory several verses, but somehow I blanked on the passage that I was leading us to. And afterwards, I was just like, oh, idiot. But it didn't take long for me to to stop beating myself up and to actually do what Jesus says in this passage. I read it over and over again. And then I did it. I went to him, and when I went to this God, I didn't find a door that had been shut in my face because of my many mistakes and failures. No, I discovered a God who actually opened that door because he wants to keep company with me. I love, I love how this passage ends. It says, keep company with me, and I will show you how to live lighter and freer. That's the God we meet in prayer, the one that actually wants to take that heavy backpack off of us to show us uh, a better way. It's the God who wants to come as we are, who doesn't need us to put on that best face, but actually wants us to come warts and all. Because the truth is, in prayer, we don't put our confidence in our own spirituality. It's not in the content of our prayer and what we say. It's, it's actually the one that we pray to. That's who we have confidence. That's why we're even praying. It's like First John tells us. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And that means something. 
The fact that God hears us means something. It means something about who he is, but also about our relationship with him. Michael Iaconelli, in uh, Dangerous Wonder, he talks about how he'd have those moments with his daughter, and she'd ask all these different questions. At a young age, you know when a child is next to you and suddenly they ask you a question like, how many stars are in the sky? Or why does grandma have so many wrinkles? Or why are you bald? Um, or how do you fish, uh, breathe underwater? All these different questions. And you might be busy in the moment and you might just give them sort of an uh, answer that just sort of came off the top of your head. Or you might have really been thoughtful about it and tried to help them to know. But in most cases, they, they hear what you have to say and they're like, oh, thank you. And then they walk away. And Iaconelli makes the point that in, in most cases, the child doesn't, you know, come into those moments just wanting to know that bit of information. What they really want to know is that the thing that they're thinking or wondering about or feeling in that moment matters to you. That that thing that is on their mind is actually valued by somebody else. They want to feel heard because when we answer them back, it's like a way of saying, oh, I love you. And that's the God we meet in prayer. That's the one that Jesus is trying to introduce to us in Matthew 7. The God who hears these things we bring before him and he cares. He listens. God hears you because he loves you. He also speaks because he loves you. Thankfully, one of the most important parts of prayer is listening because we have something to hear from God. And the truth is, if I don't hear that voice enough, I'm lost. It was Jesus who said that his sheep would know him by his voice. Do you know his voice? In your day-to-day -day comings and goings, in your conversations, in your social media posts, in, in the listening of the world news and all the other voices, do you know his voice? In the decisions you make, and running from A to B to C, are you hearing his voice? Mm. Lily Trotter, she says that we don't find that safe, safe path when we follow the other sheep. It is only when we follow the shepherd. It is when we hear his voice and, and we go. But what about the times when it feels like he's not speaking? In those moments when it feels like he is AWOL, absent without leave, when we lift up these prayers like Ortberg describes and we're like lifting them up to the ceiling and it feels like they're bouncing back at us and we're getting nothing from them and we're holding on to these things and we don't know where to put them and, and we feel like we can't let them go because it doesn't feel like anyone's taking them from us. And he shares a story about a, 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 late, a, girl, a younger woman named Nancy who had been in a relationship with someone and she thought that this was the one and she'd been praying for a long time for this person and things were going well and then they all fell apart and she had prayed that it all come back together and it didn't. And she had wondered where those prayers were going and uh, later on Nancy actually marries John Ortberg so he says he thinks it worked out in the end for her. Um, but this idea that the God we pray to, he does answer us. Even in those moments when it feels like he's AWOL, as Meister Elkhart put it, God is like someone who clears their throat when they're hiding so they can give away where they are. It's that moment we suddenly realize, there he is. I want to make something clear here. When we pray, God doesn't often reveal himself in a burning bush or through some kind of transfiguration. Most of the time, it comes through the things that we overlook or ignore or don't realize they're God speaking. And there's still real and supernatural just the same. I want to say this for the kids, both young and old. God, he often speaks by pulling on our heartstrings. He makes us care about the things that his heart breaks for. He uh, sometimes puts an idea into our heads or a, a vision of something, a picture of something, or a word, or he gives us a gentle nudge. Sometimes it's that feeling in our gut that we know not to go a certain way or do a certain thing. Sometimes it's a peace beyond understanding. Suddenly, we're okay with the situation. We have no idea why. But we just know we're in his hands. Sometimes when he speaks, it takes a long time and it requires patience. Sometimes it comes quickly and it's loud and clear like a truth bomb. I say this, you need to beware. When God speaks back, sometimes he speaks in truth bombs or 
or you have one of those Columbo moments. And kids, yeah, before streaming services, before color TV, there was this TV show called Columbo, and your grandparents watched it, and it was about a detective who would ask people, like witnesses and suspects, all these different questions, and after they said everything they wanted to say and they assumed they were off the hook, then Columbo would say, oh, just one more thing, ma'am, or one more thing, sir, and then suddenly you knew there was more to the story than they were telling. In prayer, this happens. When we are bringing our stuff to God and we're complaining, or t- which is totally fine, he can, he, he can take it, but he also reveals the truth of a situation at times. We, we lay all these things out to him and we feel jaded and we feel, we feel like we're being wronged. And, and then suddenly, God says, one more thing, Larry. One more thing, Kim. And then suddenly that he reveals something in a very investigative manner that we had been overlooking or hiding. And we're like, oh yeah, there's a bigger picture here. When God speaks, sometimes he speaks in truth bombs or Columbo moments. The God we pray to, he is pure truth, which we need so badly in a world full of conspiracy theories and misinformation. And the God we meet in prayer, he is is pure grace, which we also need in this world that is lacking, lacking mercy and lacking compassion. He wants to do something in us when we pray. Pray is like this act, prayer is this activity like reading the word where he reforms our minds or he restores our hearts. It's tremendous what happens when we lift our prayers up to God. There was an Anglican minister. His name was J.C. Ryle. He says, if you cha- train your children in anything, train them at least in the habit of prayer. Because when we have that exchange with God, something happens in us. Maybe we suddenly see things different or feel different about things. Maybe we feel the thing we've been longing to feel all along, but we didn't know how to get there, and God gets us there. He helps us to arrive. And see, when we pray, something happens in us, but also something happens in the world around us. And I've seen this. I've seen this in my home. On the nights when Anna and my two oldest sons will have their nightly prayer time, and it doesn't happen every night, so do not burden yourself with that expectation. And it's not formal by any means. But what happens is Anna will often start with with a short prayer, and then another one of them will pray, and another one of them will pray, and another one of them will pray, and another one of them. These prayers are like popcorn, like popping here, 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 here. You walk into this space, and it's almost as if there is this this divine conversation happening in stereo. And you know as you walk in that God is answering this prayer and answering that prayer and here, pop, 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 pop. And it is powerful. And it reminds me every time I witness it that families were meant to pray together. The prayer isn't just a corporate experience. It's also very personal. You see, I know a lot of Christians who are really great at teaching their children corporate prayer. They, they pray with them at bedtime or at the, the dinner table. Or maybe they'll pray with them when they're driving and they hear an ambulance. You know, like, God, please help those, those health care workers and give strength and healing to whoever needs medical aid right now. And they're great at, at teaching them corporate prayer in places like these. But prayer is also supposed to be very personal. You see, it's supposed to also be an exchange with the Jesus who made their hearts and lives in their hearts. At times, it's supposed to be the kind of thing in which a person can just lay themselves bare, strip down all the other things, take off all the other hats. In my case, in prayer, there are moments when I need to take off that pastor hat and that father hat and that husband hat and that whatever you want to call it hat, and then suddenly the only thing that I am wearing is that truest identity that I found when I accepted Jesus into my heart. There are moments in prayer when I just simply need to be Christian. There's a, a famous priest of the Cistercian order who, uh, sist- sorry, I, said, I actually mispronounced that. Let me get this real quick. Sister Sian tradition. And he says, when it comes to prayer, it's not that difficult. You, you need only pick up the practice. But there's no way of learning how to pray in a personal sense. For, you have to return to yourself, your true and deepest nature, 
to that human being in Jesus that you already are purely and simply by grace. Nobody can learn how to see, for seeing is something we do by nature. So too with prayer. An authentic personal prayer has to be something that is experienced, but it is something we can model for our children. There are moments in Anna's upbringing when she'd walk into the room in the morning and she'd find her mom praying. She'd find her sort of laying over the couch with her knees on the ground, and there are moments when I saw that in that home. I'd come downstairs and I just saw her having this prayer time with God and some of it was lifting up things that were bothering and some of it was just knowing God is faithful and good. Our kids don't need to see this perfect, pious life, this sort of modeled spirituality that they can never attain or reach for. What they need to see is imperfect people and perfectly pursuing God and experiencing the one who, who makes us righteous, the one who cleans us of all of our wrongs and failures. I remember one of my professors in seminary, he said one of the most powerful things he ever saw was walking into his parents' bedroom who were perfect by no means. He was a pastoral care professor and he'd share all kinds of family stories. They were perfect by no means, but he'd he'd walk in and he would find them both on their knees on on opposite sides of the bed and they'd be holding hands in the middle and they'd be praying just the imprint, the impact that had on his own life, knowing that you're supposed to go to God to cultivate these kind of practices. And Sometimes we tell ourselves, well, I can't do that because I haven't done that in a long time or I've never done that before. But the thing is, is that this is the God who's always opening his door. He he doesn't need us to, to grace this door over and over again before it's always open to us. Sometimes it's just the first time and he opens it up. Bear with me, this isn't open easy. but he makes it available to us. Braden asks this question, how does God answer prayers? And personally, I've seen him answer so many prayers when I've called out that name, when I've said that simple word, Jesus. And then he knew what I meant and he knew what I needed. I've I've seen him do tremendous things, but I've also experienced frustrating moments when I've lifted up a prayer over and over again, and I hear his voice saying, those who wait on the Lord, he will renew their strength. And then there are moments when he answers prayer. I go through that open door, and I can't help but realize how much he is there for me. In either case, he is always present, always listening, always hearing. I've never once regretted praying. Because this is the vehicle through which God intervenes in this world. And there's a story in in, uh, God is Closer Than You Think about a woman named Kim, who when she was a little girl, her dad pulled over on the side of the road to help somebody with a blown tire. And he's under the vehicle because something is wrong with it. And then suddenly another car hits that vehicle and the car lands on his chest. Um, puncturing, uh, breaking several ribs, puncturing his lungs. He, his, his thumb was, was completely ripped off. He was bleeding profusely. And his mother, who's not even five feet tall, she goes to the bumper of this vehicle, and in Jesus' name, she pulls it up, and she actually lifts it. And a couple weeks later, she learns that she actually like, uh, broke a couple vertebrae. Like, it, was, it was very bad. Um, but she lifts it up. The, her husband is, is removed from under the vehicle, and the ambulance arrives, and, and they're talking in terms of, well, let's not worry about his thumb. We don't even know if he'll survive. But then he gets to the hospital, and his, his very pale face suddenly starts turning pinkish, and he starts to come back alive. And uh, the, the surgeons are, are there, and they're, they're helping him out. And, and then he leads them in, dearest Lord Jesus. And they don't even put him on oxygen. And he makes a full turn, and it's later learned that his father-in-law, his father-in-law was a pastor, during that period of time was leading his congregation in prayer for him. And there we see both a personal prayer and corporate prayer being answered by God. Because this is the Jesus who is always saying, come and knock on my door, I've been waiting for you. This is the God who doesn't want us to complicate this exchange, but just to keep it simple. 
To not babble like the, the pagans do, thinking that they need to say all these fancy spiritual religious words in order to gain obvi- audience with the one who is in the Holy of Holies. But no, sometimes it's days when we just blurt out, Jesus. And he wants us to come as we are, not perfect, not with a a perfect face on, not pretend like we have it all together. He wants us to come as we are, to take off all those hats, to lay ourselves bare to where we are in our truest, most pure form, that pure form that accepted Jesus into our hearts. And we're just simply Christian. And he wants us to experience prayer, both on a corporate level, but also on a personal level, when we have this beautiful exchange with the Jesus who lives in our hearts. He doesn't want anything to hinder us from his presence. He wants us to come to him like children. And he gives us that invitation every single day. I'm going to read this again because I want it to be the news that you leave with today. Matthew 7, he says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. He's saying, come and keep company with me and find a lighter and freer way to live. Let's go to that God in prayer. Jesus, we know you are here right now. We know you're always inviting us into your presence. Sometimes we feel so far away from you. We feel like you've gone AWOL. But the truth is, is that you're always there. And you're always hearing us because you love us. Speak to us today. As the kids here, young and old, pray to you this week, give that tug on their hearts, that nudge, that vision, that picture, speak to them, God. Give some of us those truth bombs and Columbo moments we need. But most of all, help us to hear you saying, come and knock on my door. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please join us as we lift up praise to to our God who loves us so much and calls us to come to him as we are.
Brothers and sisters, please receive this blessing. May you sense this week when you enter prayer that your Father wants you to come and keep him company, that his door is always open. And may you never forget that Jesus, he has opened that door, that he intercedes on our behalf, that he intervenes, that he is always with us. And may the Spirit enable us, even in those tough moments, to just say that shortest prayer that pierces heaven, to just say, Jesus, and all of God's people say,